Okay, and uh, so welcome. We are going to be talking about the transmission mechanism of monetary policy. Now, as far as I know some of the other songs that I played earlier with some of these lectures, there's actually a reason for it. There was no reason for that. I just wanted to just throw in some random metal because why the hell not, right? Because metal's awesome. Uh, so anyways, transmission mechanisms of monetary policy. So this is really just going to be a short lecture on how monetary policy works. We're going to look at a couple of different channels of monetary policy, namely three channels. There's going to be the portfolio rebalance, signaling, and then the risk channel of monetary policy. So without further ado, let's uh, get started. So first things first, what's a transmission mechanism of monetary policy? Well, I've already told you this like a billion times already. It's just how a monetary policy shock transmits to the real economy. The Wikipedia definition from Sunday, December 2nd, 2018 at 6.49 p.m. states, The monetary transmission mechanism is the process by which asset prices and general economic conditions are affected as a result of monetary policy decisions. So we know the Fed's controlling the money supply by buying and selling treasuries, which then affects the amount of excess reserves that banks have, which affects how much they can lend out, and ultimately what the price of borrowing is, which is the interest rate. The transmission mechanism is how this policy affects output, unemployment, investment, etc. And there are two types of transmission mechanisms we're going to talk about in this lecture, and then the next lecture is going to cover the third type. So we're going to talk interest rate channels, which there are two types. So actually, I guess I sort of lied. There are three types we're going to talk about. So there's interest rate channels. There are two here. There's long-term rate channels and short-term rate channels. And then there's the risk channel, which was what I thought was going to be the third one, but I was being stupid. Uh, the risk channel is a little different. So, well, okay, brief overview of the financial crisis, quantitative easing. Well, here's the federal funds rate. We can see this black line right here is when the financial crisis hit. Boom, zero lower bound. So we were pretty screwed. We couldn't really do very much. I already showed you this. Federal Reserve purchased all these securities by creating excess reserve balances. So let financial institutions meet their short-term obligations without having to dump all their assets at a huge discount, which means the economy loses value overnight, increase the money base without screwing with the money supply, gives more liquidity to banks, they can do what they need to do with it, and make sure it doesn't enter the money supply. How would they do that? Well, they paid interest on excess reserves to prevent that from entering the money supply, which would then, had it entered the money supply, would have generated rampant inflation. So basically, banks just got to sit on these reserves and earn interest on them, and the money supply, as we see here, between 2008 and 2010, really didn't see much of a change. It ultimately still followed its long-run trend, which says basically quantitative easing at least did the right thing by not affecting the money supply. So there's at least one part of quantitative easing we can easily eyeball and go, yeah, not much really happened here, which is good. <clears throat> now... Interest rate channels work through what's known as a term structure of interest rates, and it's the relationship between interest rates and bond yields of different maturities. It's also known as the yield curve. So if you affect the interest rate of one maturity, then you're going to affect the others through the term structure, and that relative price change is going to cause borrowing or lending behavior to be altered as well. This is the yield curve. So we have a nominal interest rate over time. Now, this isn't like 1990, 1991, 1992, this is the duration of the maturity. As we can see, the longer the maturity, the higher the interest rate. Why? Well, if you let someone borrow money for a month, you're probably going to charge them a little bit of an interest rate, but relative to what it would be if they were to borrow it for, say, three years, well, that's three years that you can't do anything with that money. That's going to really suck. You're going to charge a really high interest rate because that's three years you can't do anything, that's a pretty substantial opportunity cost. You need to be compensated for that. So a higher interest rate is charged for a longer duration maturity. Now, during conventional monetary policy, the Fed just affects short-term interest rates. It feeds through the term structure, ultimately lowering it. And this is what's known as a short-term interest rate channel. And the idea is that this is the yield curve before monetary policy. This is the yield curve after monetary policy. It flattens the yield curve. But when short-term rates were way too low to pull this off, the Fed starts buying longer-term treasuries to flatten out the yield curve, which tweaks the longer end of the yield curve. Now, when monetary policy operates through the intention of affecting long-term rates in lieu of short-term rates, that's what's known as a long-term interest rate channel. 
So what we're going to do is, well, actually, what, not what we're going to do, what I did, was I looked at it using a vector autoregression, and I would see if I could identify whether short-term or long-term interest rate channels were operating here. Now, for this VAR estimation, I used six variables. First, I used the log of industrial production. It's treated as a proxy for gross domestic product because industrial production is actually an index, and this index is reported monthly, whereas GDP is reported quarterly. So if we want to have a slightly higher frequency, which means more data that we can look at, that we can play with, more observations, which is always good, more data are always better than less data, well, we can use the log of industrial production, and it's a good proxy for GDP. Now we're going to have the log of the price level, the log of reserve balances. So last time I used securities, but we can also look at this in terms of reserve balances. So one of the things I'm doing by changing the data around a little bit is showing you you can use certain things as proxies for others, and you will ultimately get similar results. So in this case, the log of reserve balances would be used to stimulate a monetary policy shock. We're going to have a short-term interest rate, which is the three-month treasury yield, a long-term rate, which is a 10-year treasury yield, which you've seen in the last lecture that I gave, and then we're also going to have real S&P 500 prices. Now, the first step is to see if the shock actually does anything to production. Anytime we want to look at a channel of monetary policy, the first question is, make sure it actually that there's actually some sort of real economic activity that got spurred by this monetary policy intervention. Otherwise, you're really just spinning your wheels and going nowhere because nothing happened. Now, production doesn't significantly respond. There's no transmission mechanism. So we just first need to make sure production responds. If it does, then we can investigate how it worked. So question one, does it work? Question two, how? Now, in order to identify this, this is getting a little bit into some nitty gritty stuff. I use a certain type of identification strategy. Basically, if we can expect demand and supply shocks to look like this, then I can incorporate that with some economic theory and go, okay, any set of shocks that I simulate using this VAR, where output and price move together, that's a demand shock. If output and price move in opposite directions, it's a supply shock. So I can use economic theory and impose qualitative restrictions on what impulse responses I want to look at. So this is the way I would identify a monetary policy shock. Namely, this is what I would expect a monetary policy shock to do. Now, because first, we're really just interested in whether or not production changes, we're not going to suppose any change to production. We're going to basically impose restrictions on other stuff and then let the data speak for itself when it comes to the response of production. So reserve balances are going to increase. So we got a nice little positive sign here. Now, when reserve balances increase, right, that's the monetary aggregate, that's the monetary policy shock. So the interest rates on both the short and long-term yields are going to fall. At the same time, because these yields are falling and the monetary aggregates increasing, consumer prices are going to have to increase as well. That's just consistent with lowering interest rates and increasing a monetary aggregate. Now, I've got these two zero impact restrictions here, basically meaning consumer prices and output can't respond in the first period. So it's kind of like that new Keynesian argument of like sticky prices. Consumer prices can't respond immediately because if this is a shock, if this is truly a surprise to the economy, then it's going to take a little while. It'll take within that first month for output and prices to respond, assuming output responds at all. And then I leave S&P 500 stuff um, completely unrestricted as well because, well, this is going to be one of the big indicators as to whether or not a transmission mechanism will be actually activated here. Now, when I impose sign restriction identification, I can let it hold for really as long as I want. Here, I just hold it for six months. And then I scale the impulse responses to be consistent with a 1% reduction in the Fed funds rate. Now, the first thing is going to see if real variables change. If real variables change, then we're good. Then we can go, all right, well, real variables moved. What happens to some of these interest rates? And then we can establish what the transmission mechanism was that triggered that economic response. Now, when we're looking at interest rate channels, there's going to be two things. First, which interest rate falls by more? Second, which one falls more significantly? So when you impose a shock in this VAR, you can scale the shock to whatever you want. It's a linear model. So remember when I was talking about the RBC model and I said you could literally just flip the signs around? It's the same idea here.
This is a linear model, so with linearity, you can scale things up or down, you can make them positive, you can make them negative. As long as you just do it consistently across the board for all the variables in every equation, you're fine. It really doesn't matter. So in this case, I scaled the responses to a 100% increase in reserve balances. So I don't know why I said I scaled the other one to a 1% reduction in the Fed funds rate. That's stupid. Don't listen to that part. Just listen to this part. So here's what we get. Well, did output increase? Yes, it did. So we get a monetary aggregate increase. Reserve balances here increase by 100%. We can see consumer prices increase. That's consistent with the restrictions we put in. Both interest rates fall, again, consistent with the restrictions that I put in place. Well, let's look at industrial production. Well, it goes up. How much does it go up? A little bit more than one and a half percentage points. So probably more like 1.75, 1.8 percentage points above steady state. So that's pretty good. So we can see there's definitely real, there's definitely a response in real economic activity here. Now, let's look at the S&P 500. Well, there's about a six percentage point increase in the S&P 500 index. So again, that's pretty good. That says this is a real variable, this is a real variable. They both increased. So first, when we're going, did real variables respond in this case? Yes. Next, okay, what are the interest rates? Well, let's just sort of sum up what happened. Output went up, both interest rates fell. But if we look, the 10-year Treasury yield falls by a lot more than the three-month Treasury yield does. Three-month Treasury yield drops by 40 basis points, or basically 0.4 of a percent, whereas a 10-year Treasury yield drops closer to 80 basis points, or 0.8 of a percent, meaning, okay, this one drops almost 1%, and this drops less than half of a percent. So just which one fell more? Well, this one fell more. The next question is, which one fell more significantly? Well... Let's go back, look at this. Oh, shit, scrolling around. Okay, significantly. Well, okay, so this is significant really just for the first, like, four, maybe five months. Here, it's significant across the entire time horizon. This one's more of a significant reduction than this. This is a larger reduction than this. Meaning, well, we probably saw a long-term interest rate channel activation going on in this data set. So long-term interest rate channel gets activated during data that spans the financial crisis and quantitative easing. But wait, there's more, as once said the great and sad, sadly late Billy Mays. Do miss that guy. He was so cool. There are types of these short and long-term interest rate channels. So let's start with short-term channels. Under what's known as forward guidance in monetary policy, monetary policy changes can affect the expected future path of short-term interest rates. It sends a signal to investors the central bank plans to keep rates either lower or higher than longer than what was previously anticipated. So if the Federal Reserve comes out and says, we want to cut interest rates, or say interest rates have already been cut, they're at zero, we want to hold them at zero for two quarters. And then a quarter later, they come out and say, you know, we're going to hold them at zero for more like, I don't know, another six quarters. Well, that's sending a signal to investors that the Fed doesn't expect economic conditions to get much better. So they're going to keep interest rates low to try to help continue to sort of provide a buffer for economic activity. So because this change is now going to be in place for longer than what was anticipated, it sends a signal to these investors the economic activity isn't going to be improving that much, and they alter their decisions based on that, and it's what's known as a signaling channel of monetary policy. Now, if it works through long-term interest rate channels, something a little different happens. I'd sort of talked about this in the last lecture. Long-term assets have higher yields. Responses to monetary policy are going to operate differently if it goes through long-term assets because the yields are higher. Now, investors are going to have like a preferred yield. Anything within that little area of their preferences for this yield, they'll continue to hold it. Anything that goes outside of their yield preferences, say below that yield, if it crosses that threshold, then when these government bond yields drop, investors don't like it, so they try to get back to their preferred habitat by seeking yield in private asset markets. And this is what's known as a portfolio rebalance channel of monetary policy. So going back to the VAR, let's see what these impulse responses look like again. Well, 
we can really look to see whether it was a signaling or portfolio rebalance channel. And because we'd already concluded it was a long-term interest rate channel, chances are portfolio rebalancing effects happened here. If it was to happen, long-term rates would respond more significantly than short-term rates. Some proxy for asset markets would significantly respond. Well, in this case, it would be the response to the S&P 500. And that's actually what we see here. There's a significant positive and significant response in the S&P 500 and a negative and significant response in the long-term interest rate. Meaning, when we look at this, we can not just tell the story of the new Keynesian model predictions where monetary aggregate increases and then prices go up, interest rates fall, output goes up. We can tell a little bit more of a story because we're looking at different interest rates. So we're considering the shape of the yield curve, shape of the yield curve, sound that out, Jeremy, and ultimately what is the term structure of interest rate. So we can see that the yield curve is flattening because the three-month treasury is falling a little bit and the 10-year treasury is falling by a lot. So the yield curve is getting flatter. And investors are going, oh, man, I don't like that I'm getting really low yield on this 10-year treasury. So I'm going to dump all my 10-year treasuries, or at least a lot of them, and I'm going to rebalance my portfolio in favor of equity market stuff. So they go into the S&P 500, Dow Jones, whatever. Any equity markets, they're going to go in, they're going to purchase more equities. Well, what that ends up meaning is then the price of equities will go up. S&P 500 index, Dow Jones whichever one you want to use, is going to increase. And then that is going to trigger a response in output, which is industrial production in this case. So the portfolio rebalance channel got activated. So investors were happy with high government bond yields. They get hit with low government bond yields, say, screw that, go to the S&P 500, buy some stocks, go into private bond markets, anything of that nature. So either short or long-term interest rate channels can be activated. Both can't be simultaneously. Now, while one or the other can be operating as far as these interest rate channels, there is another channel that can operate simultaneously with either of these first two, which is what we're going to talk about next. So as we're going to be talking about the risk channel of monetary policy, I thought, yeah, you know what, what the hell? I already showed you guys one chapter out of my dissertation. I might as well show you another one. And this is actually the defense for my dissertation that I gave on Friday, in case you were wondering why not very much was done last week. That's why. In case you are also wondering why not very much on my end was done over the weekend, again, this is why. So I thought, what the hell, I'll just show you guys a little bit of my dissertation. Because honestly, with everything that I have taught you over the course of this semester, you will actually be able to understand about 95% of my dissertation defense, which is exactly what I wanted to have happen in the first place. Because... If you're going to learn macroeconomics, you might as well learn macroeconomics. Like that one guy said, the only way to do a thing is to do the thing. So let's talk about the third channel of monetary policy, which is the risk channel. And here I'm going to be looking at how monetary policy shocks impact bank lending behavior. So again, financial crisis stuff. Boom. We've already seen this. We've already seen this. We've already seen this. Hmm. Okay. This is cool. So, all right, here's where a little bit more theory stuff comes into play. So during recessions, there's going to be an increase in demand for liquidity in customers, as far as the bank side thing is concerned. Now, with this increase in demand for liquidity in customers, well, commercial bank profitability is going to fall. Now, unconventional monetary policy, which is monetary policy that isn't used to just affect short-term rates, or at least short-term rates when they're substantially above zero, unconventional monetary policy can further compress banks' profit margins. And it does so either in the form of negative interest rates. So while the United States has, at least currently, um, as of yet, strayed away from negative interest rate policies, other economies have actually experimented with negative interest rates. We've seen it in Japan. We've seen it in the euro area. So we could have negative interest rate policies, or we could flatten the yield curve through quantitative easing. And quantitative easing ultimately in the United States served as a substitute for negative interest rate policies. Either way, either of these two are going to mean a massive increase in liquidity for these banks, which could incentivize more risky lending and asset acquisition for banks. Why? Well, if they've got more vault cash that they're sitting on, well, that gives them more freedom to engage in particularly risky behavior. So the research questions are this. Are banks willing to take more risk to stabilize their reductions in profit margins? 
If so, by how much? And are they able to offset the effects of this reduction? Next, how much risk are they willing to take and how does it compare to the pre-financial crisis period? Well, to talk about this a little bit, banks end up using riskier lending practices to stabilize their profit margins. I use a counterfactual analysis where I allow for interest rates to go below the zero lower bound in the United States. And this allows me to compare monetary policy shocks across the pre and post financial crisis periods. I find, fortunately for, uh, well, all of us, banks actually take way less risk in the post financial crisis period relative to the pre financial crisis period. However, unfortunately, they experience a larger compression in their lending margins, which is the difference between the interest rate that they're earning on new loans and the interest rate they're paying out on new deposits, which is basically a profit margin. So findings basically suggest the risk channel played a larger role in unconventional monetary policy regimes when compared to the conventional regime. So quantitative easing, we already discussed this, increase the money base, don't mess with the money supply, flatten out the yield curve, lower risk spread. So basically the differences in risk between assets of similar maturities. The idea is to spur economic recovery by increasing real economic activity and prices. Now, as far as the research goes, quantitative easing or QE, as I'll just call it from now on because it's easier to say, less syllables, you know, what the hell. QE affects the real economy, but the amount it does and why is still somewhat unclear. Now, they know the initial effect is on bond yields, but long-term effects can be a little bit more difficult to establish. So this is what we were talking about with some of the previous transmission mechanisms. There was the portfolio rebalance channel. There was a signaling channel. Now, either of these two can operate at one time. Both can't simultaneously. But this third one can operate in conjunction or in tandem with either of the first two. And here, under the risk channel of monetary policy, monetary intervention affects perceptions of risk, which then alters the behavior of economic agents. So it can operate through various sectors of the economy. You could have consumer confidence channels being activated where interest rates drop as a result of monetary intervention, and then people decide to finance new cars, refrigerators, TVs, custom USA Jackson guitars, anything like that. That would be signaled through the consumer confidence channels. I shouldn't say signal because that suggests signaling channel. We would It would be indicated through consumer confidence channels. But there's also a financial market and banking sector channel that is of some kind of interest here. Now, both of these do have moral hazard implications because if Fed policy is seen as a bailout for previously bad behavior, it can incentivize more risk to be taken in the future. Now, there's a paper by Wheel and Wheeledeck in 2016 where they discuss both ways that the risk channel could operate, but they only address, they only address the consumer confidence channels. They don't talk about the financial markets and banking sector behavior. Now, New and Kirk and Nokel in 2018 assessed this risk channel in the euro area operating through the financial market sector, but they don't do it in the U.S., there's a good bit of research in the U.S. with the risk channel, but it's done using micro data. So that what they're doing is they're using like individual bank level data and looking at this stuff. But the research on the macro effects of this stuff and what the macro policy implications would be in the United States is still relatively unaddressed, which leaves a nice, wonderfully, beautifully sized, massive hole of research that I now get to fill in with my dissertation. So... The risk channel operates through what's known as a search for yield. So let's say there's an economic agent and there's a certain amount of risk that this agent is willing to take. And let's say they're currently earning 5% yield on treasuries. Well, when there's a monetary policy shock, these asset purchases communicate the monetary authority is going to be screwing around with the risk structure of the economy. And as a result, plus just this massive liquidity injection, treasury yields are going to drop from 5% down to 2%. Now, let's say the bottom end of their preferred yield is, say, like 3%. Well, they're not going to be happy if they're earning 2%. So while there's this preferred yield area, there's also preferred risk habitat. So there's like a risk and reward trade-off that's being faced here. So if they've got this nice little window of yield that they're comfortable earning, there's also going to be what's known as a preferred risk habitat. If they remain in that risk habitat and they're getting their, their yield that they like, then everything's good. But if that yield drops, depending on how much it drops by and the level that it drops to, 
these agents may actually be willing to step outside their preferred risk habitat. So they're stepping outside their comfort zone. And they're willing to do so so long as they're going to be compensated by getting the yield that they want. So it's really done on their preferences for risk and reward. Now, Neil and Kirk and Oak will find that banks, large banks, lower their lending standards, which is treated as a measure of risk here, in response to monetary policy shocks in the euro area to stabilize their lending margins. However, they're not successful in doing so. So the idea is, if we look at lending standards, treat that as a measure of risk. Are they willing to take on more risk in order to maintain their profit? Now, in order to do this in the U.S., I estimate a VAR to assess the impact the risk channel has on bank lending behavior. Now, the VAR looks something like this. Don't worry about it. I use two lags. Again, don't worry about it. Data are quarterly, and they span the fourth quarter of 08 up to the fourth quarter of 2018. The variables that I use are log of real GDP, log of the core PCE price index, log of reserve balances held by depository institutions at the Fed, interest on excess reserves, which serves as like the Fed's policy rate here because they switched from the federal funds rate over to interest on excess reserves for at least a short-term policy rate. There's the 10-year treasury yield, which is used to capture the term structure of interest rates. I've got bank lending standards, which is the net percentage of domestic banks that are reporting tightening in credit conditions. So what happens is the Fed will send out a survey to 80 of the largest banks in the United States. And when they take the survey, the answers eventually all sort of get aggregated by the Fed once you know the survey is returned to them. And they look at it and go, okay, are these guys basically reporting that credit conditions or lending conditions really – are tightening, meaning it's harder to get a loan, or are they showing that it's easier to get a loan? So the harder it is to get a loan, the more bank lending standards are going to increase. The easier it becomes to get a loan, lending standards fall. So are they making it easier or harder to get a loan? Namely here, are they making it easier to get a loan in order to increase their lending margins, which is the difference between interest rates on new business loans and a weighted average interest rate on new deposits from households and non-financial corporations. So if you are lending out money at, say, 10%, but you are paying interest on deposits at, like, 5%, so every deposit that comes in, you pay 5% on that, but you're earning 10% on every new loan you make, then your lending margins are 5%. Now, when the lending margins decrease, when they compress, as I said earlier, what happens is you are either paying more on deposits while holding the amount of earnings or the, the rate of earnings constant, or what's more likely to happen is that you are going to be earning less on new loans while you're still paying the same amount on deposits. So if what you're paying or what you're earning in loans drops from 10% down to 8%, but you're still paying 5%, your lending margin just compressed from 5% down to 3%. So if we look at lending standards and lending margins over the entire sample period, which covers 1990 up to the fourth quarter of 2018, so this is the pre- and post-financial crisis period in my sample, we can see that for these shaded areas, which represent when the U.S. economy is in a recession, there are spikes in lending standards. Now, if we were to also kind of eyeball this for the lending margins, we can see it's following a downward trend. So lending margins are compressing over time. But let's look at some of the short-run behavior of this. Okay, huge dip in lending margins. Huge dip in lending margins. Okay, well, that's not super conclusive, but it might give us something here. Probably will. What we can gather from this is that whenever we hit a recession, banks are going to be stricter about who they lend money to and at the same time, because as stated from the previous findings of other uh, theory papers, banks are going to experience an increase in competition for liquidity and customers. Liquidity injections further compress their lending margins, so ultimately they're going to see a massive reduction in profit. So identification stuff, I'm not too worried about this because you don't need to know how to do any of this stuff. Plus, I've also kind of already talked about it a little bit. So, all right, here's how I identify a monetary policy shock here. So, 
I know I said earlier, first we need to see if output responds. Well, there's a lot of literature out there suggesting output responded positively in this case. So I'm sort of skipping that first step because that first step's already been done. Because whenever, like when we talked about growth and I said everything is compounding on itself, well, I'm not going to need to do this to see if GDP goes up if we already know GDP goes up from previous studies with very similar specifications. It went up. So I take that and I run with it and I do the next step. So instead of looking at if here, I just look at how. So how do I do this? Well, first I impose a positive sign restriction on reserve balances. So the monetary aggregate increases. Both interest rate variables are going to fall. Prices and output are going to increase, but they're not allowed to increase on impact. They can only increase immediately after the impact. So again, that's like that new Keynesian argument I was talking about with sticky prices. Prices are going to be slow to adjust, but in this case, because we're looking at production or GDP, then it's not just going to go, oh, hey, cool, monetary policy shock, GDP just went up. No, you're going to have to start producing. You're going to have to make plans to increase your economic activity, and that's going to take a little bit of time. How much? Well, probably not that much. But my guess is it's not going to happen on impact. It's probably going to happen, you know, maybe a day or two later. So if it responds within the first quarter, we can see that. It's not going to stay flat for one quarter. It's just going to be at zero when the impact hits, and then it immediately spikes up. So I scale these impulse responses now to a one standard deviation increase in reserve balances. Because, again, like I said, you can scale these things up or down however you'd like. Now, the sign restrictions hold for two quarters, meaning these asset purchases are persisting for about six months, which is more or less roughly the average amount of time that QE was in place. So I report the median impulse responses, and I don't worry about that shit. Okay, so impulse responses to a monetary policy shock. So we can see output goes up, prices go up. Well, I kind of put that in place. Interest on excess reserves, 10-year treasury yield fall. We can see that here, again, it's more of a long-term interest rate channel that's operating. But that's not what we're super interested in. We're looking at lending standards and lending margins. Namely, are banks willing to lower their lending standards? Meaning, are they willing to give out more loans, engage in riskier behavior, take on more risk, in order to offset this profit reduction that they're currently experiencing? So we look at this and we see lending standards drop by 10 percentage points. So if the lending standards were currently at, say, like 50, well, they would drop 10 percentage points down to 40. Lending margins, okay, so on impact, they drop 100 basis points, and then they drop a little bit further to about 150 basis points, and they actually remain there. But as we see, this confidence band increases, crosses the threshold of zero, meaning, well, here there's no significant response. So what we can see banks lower lending standards. They take more risk to try to prevent lending margins from falling, but lending margins fall anyways. And they fall significantly, as we can see here. So they take more risk, try to stabilize profit margins or lending margins, but they're not very successful at doing it. But they're probably more successful than if they had done nothing. But that's not exactly what we're interested in here. It's just, did they do it? Did they prevent lending margins from falling? The answer is yes and no, in that order. So here, if I were to just scale the maximum responses consistent with the size of the asset purchases from quantitative easing, we'd see the first round of quantitative easing had the largest impact on lending standards and lending margins. Basically, we see about an 18 percentage point reduction in lending standards and nearly a full percentage point reduction in lending margins. Now, if we were to aggregate this shit over all three rounds of quantitative easing, we'd see that there would be about a 26 percentage point reduction in lending standards averaged over the whole period and a nearly one and a half percent reduction in lending margins. So lending margins would fall from 10 down to about eight and a half percent. So there's still a compression in lending margins. And that's just for the post-financial crisis period. So let's, let's look at the pre-crisis period. Let's see what happened here. Well, we want to know how much risk is taken in the pre-financial crisis period, but we got to identify some stuff differently. We've got to estimate stuff differently because the policy tool changed. 
under quantitative easing, the policy tool was, or their policy rate was interest on excess reserves. They were also focused on flattening the yield curve. So there's also a little bit of 10 year treasury stuff going on. And they were using the quantity of reserve balances as their actual like policy variable, their instrument basically. But prior to that, it was the federal funds rate. It wasn't the quantity of money, it was the price of money. So if we do a conventional monetary policy regime estimation, we have to identify it in a way that's consistent with how the Fed actually did things. So because these policy tools were different, the specification needs to reflect that. So first, I replace interest on excess reserves with a federal funds rate. And then, I guess we've got to talk about the data too, beginning or second quarter of 1990, up until the fourth quarter of 2018, which is really as far back as some of this banking data were available. Now, to identify an unconventional monetary policy shock, like I said, we had the increase on excess reserves, but here it's conventional. So there's going to be an innovation on the policy rate equation in the VAR, which in this case is the federal funds rate. So we're putting a negative sign restriction on the Fed funds rate with positive sign restrictions on real GDP prices and reserve balances with a negative sign restriction on the 10-year Treasury yield. And these are scaled to one standard, devi one standard deviation cut in the Fed funds rate. This is the conventional monetary policy shock. So we can see the Fed funds rate gets cut. Well, all the other variables respond exactly as they were supposed to because that's the set of identifying restrictions I put in place. Let's look at lending standards. So lending standards drop by almost 30 percentage points and lending margins drop actually by a little bit less. So banks are taking more risk here, or at least so far, the way it looks, just eyeballing it, because, again, we have to identify and estimate a VAR from the unconventional period in a way that's consistent with the way this is set up. So we got a little bit more going on that we got to do. But it looks here like lending standards are dropping by a lot, and lending margins actually aren't compressing by that much. So... If we scale this to either a 25 or a 50 basis point cut in the Fed funds rate, which is generally the size of interest rate cuts that the Federal Reserve engages in, they usually cut it by a quarter of a percent or a half percent at a time. So just very small little movements, see how things go, things need to be adjusted. Well, you didn't overcorrect, basically. So it's easier just to take very small moves with this, see how things go, make a few more small moves. So... Lending standards, if we look at a 25 or a quarter of a percent cut, lending standards drop by nearly 30 percentage points. Lending margins compress by 78 basis points. Now, if we want to compare the peak responses of these impulse responses across different monetary policy regimes, we've got to identify and specify the unconventional monetary policy set of equations in a slightly different way. So here what I do is I use a counterfactual interest rate where I use what's known as the Taylor rule in place of interest on excess reserves. I identify a shock to the Taylor rule and I compare risk across regimes in a consistent manner. So the Taylor rule basically is going to account for what the federal funds rate would have been had it been allowed to dip below zero. So you've seen this guy before. You saw this when I talked about the setup of the new Keynesian model where this alpha describes how much policymakers care about deviations of inflation from the target. And this alpha Y describes how much policymakers care about GDP from potential GDP. So that's basically what this stuff is. And I calibrate this sucker in a way where I look at very dovish inflation policies. I look at, I basically assign 0 0.25 for inflation deviations and one for output deviations. And it's the rule that Ben Bernanke claimed to use during his tenure at the Federal Reserve, and when he stepped down as chairman of the Fed and Janet Yellen took over, she also claims to have used a similar policy while the federal funds rate was stuck at the zero lower bound. So one thing that's of particular interest is I only use data that was available to policymakers at the time. The Federal Reserve Economic Database is constantly revising the data that's getting posted. So if I use data that I acquired now, that's not the data that was available at the time. So fortunately, Ben Bernanke was kind enough to grace me with this data, which was really, really nice, uh, namely because he provided it in one of his papers. And so then I took that data, 
threw it into the Taylor rule and ran with it. So if we look at what the federal funds rate was, which is the blue curve, during the financial crisis leading up to the end of this particular sample period, and then we look at the Taylor rule, we can see the Taylor rule allows for the interest rate to go below the zero lower bound. Now, when I said that Bernanke and Yellen claimed to use this, they did. However, it operated through the term structure of interest rates. So they were engaging in policy that had they targeted the federal funds rate rather than other interest rates, it would have resulted in the federal funds rate going negative, as we can see here. So if I look at the impulse responses from the post-financial crisis period, using Bernanke's Taylor rule, Right, we can see lending standards drop by 11 percentage points, and there's not much of a significant move in lending margins. Okay, so there's something that we can look at there. That's a pretty interesting story. Let's try another interest rate, just for, just for shits and giggles. So I'm going to use another interest rate, and it's what's known as a shadow federal funds rate. It's provided by Wu and G in their 2016 paper, and they basically calibrated it using a term structure of the interest rate model. It's another counterfactual interest rate that is just simply what would the federal funds rate have been if it was allowed to go below zero. And the other variables remain the same. Identification strategy is still the same. Now, it was tailored in a way that prior to the financial crisis, the shadow federal funds rate was equal to the effective federal funds rate. They diverge when the financial crisis hits and they converge again when the federal funds rate was raised up to a quarter of a percent in December of 2015. So once it re went above the zero lower bound, the shadow federal funds rate and the effective Fed funds rate were equal. So they only diverged while the economy was stuck at the zero lower bound. And looking at this guy, ooh, okay, well, lending standards drop actually by about the same amount. Lending margins drop by about 150 basis points, give or take, which is actually pretty consistent with what we saw in the initial estimation here. But here we can actually compare this to the conventional monetary policy regime because it's set up in an identical way, which is good for us so that we can actually compare things in a consistent fashion. Well, lending margins here drop significantly Lending standards drop significantly. So banks take more risk. They lower their lending standards, but they still get a compression in lending margins, which kind of sucks. Now, if I were to compare the conventional and unconventional monetary policy responses here, if we look at the conventional monetary policy shock, 25 basis point cut in the policy rate, well, banks lower their lending standards by 30 percentage points. Now, if we look at what happened in the unconventional regime, either through Bernanke's Taylor rule or through the shadow Fed funds rate, we can see that they don't really come anywhere near the size of the cut in lending standards during the conventional regime. So what this says here, banks are taking less risk in the conventional monetary policy regime relative to the unconventional. So let's look at lending margins. What's happening here? Well, in the conventional regime, lending margins, or their profit margins, fall by just shy of 40 basis points. But when we look at the unconventional regime, profit margins are cut by either a full percent or just shy of a full percent. So we either have 103 basis points or an 88 basis point cut or compression in profit margins. So what we can gather from this, banks take less risk before the financial crisis than they do after. And because banks are taking less risk after the financial crisis, they're getting a much larger compression in their lending margins, which if we look, commercial and industrial loans over 2004 up to about 2018 or so, where we have these three rounds of quantitative easing, we can see there's a massive drop off in CNI loans and they don't pick up until the beginning of the second round of quantitative easing, and then they start to pick up again. This, this drop in CNI loans can be explained by seeing this reduction in lending standards. Banks are playing it safe. They're not lending out to more people because, well, there's a lot of risk and a lot of creditworthiness issues 
that kind of needed to be reassessed before they could start lending out again. So the next thing that we're going to ask is, all right, how much do these shocks contribute to the variance and observed variables over time? So when I talk about the supply side, demand side, economic stuff, that's what we're looking at here. Basically, is the risk channel more important in the pre or post financial crisis period? And I use something that's known as a forecast error variance to composition, just tells me the percentage of the variance that is explained by this shock. So when we look at lending standards and lending margins for the unconventional shock, it explains about 20% of the variance in lending standards and about closer to 25% of the variance in lending margins. When we look at the conventional monetary policy shock, it explains 15%. And at its most, eh, about 16%, 15% for lending standards, 16% for lending margins. So the conventional regime shows that the risk channel didn't play as much of a role as it did compared to the unconventional regime. A lot more of the variance or the variation in lending standards and lending margins over time were explained by an unconventional monetary policy shock rather than the conventional period. So, okay, cool. What? What the hell does this mean? Well, it means first, the Fed needs to consider the impact that this channel has when they set monetary policy. Because they've got two problems. They've got the dual mandate, which is to stabilize inflation while also trying to minimize unemployment or maximize output. But if the risk channel operates and nominal interest rates are low, that can introduce a lot of risk into the market. It can introduce a lot of volatility into financial markets, which is what we don't want. Low interest rate policies basically mean banks are going to take more risk. But they do that. That's more instability in financial markets, which is exactly what we don't need. So if the risk channel is operating and we're in an unconventional monetary policy regime like we currently are, the Fed needs to consider what the risk channel is going to be doing, how it's going to be operating, what the implications of it are. And it really leads to a rather stark conclusion that maybe the Fed should actually consider reevaluating their dual mandate. Maybe they should actually be considering some amount of risk that's, to be, that's going to be taken in the economy in response to these shocks. Because if all they're focused on is stabilizing inflation and unemployment, and they're not focused on risk in an explicit way, well, a lot of risk can be inappropriately introduced into the economy via monetary intervention, and if they're not supposed to look at it explicitly, then, well, there's a big problem here. So, research question was, how does risky bank lending respond? And banks take more risk to stabilize their profit margins, but despite taking that risk, they still experience a compression in lending margins. When we scale this stuff to match the size of the asset purchases from quantitative easing, Banks took a lot more risk during the first round than they did any of the others. Now, when I compare this stuff across both regimes and I have to identify and estimate some stuff a little differently, banks take way less risk after the financial crisis than they did before, which is good. Makes us happy. Means like, okay, well, I guess some of these guys learned their lesson after the financial crisis. I mean, Jesus. So the counterfactual analysis where I let the interest rate go below the zero lower bound suggests that when there's more lower bound flexibility, in these short-term rates, it's going to further compress lending margins. And again, provides a lot of implications regarding monetary policy during the unconventional monetary policy regime. And if the Fed doesn't do this in an explicit way, it can lead to an introduction of a lot of risk in the United States economy, which is exactly what we don't need any more of. And that concludes the final lecture for this course. Um, so I guess I need to talk about the exam really quickly. There isn't really going to be an exam. There's going to be a last problem set. It will be posted tonight, Monday evening. Uh, you will have until midnight Eastern Standard Time to complete it. It shouldn't take much more than about an hour to do. Um, whatever the remainder is, I believe there's like 20 or 30% left of your grade. That problem set will count for that remainder of your grade. Um, it has to be handed in to me by midnight on Friday. I cannot accept it any later than that. If you do not hand it in by midnight on Friday, you will get a zero. Everybody has to take this last problem set.
This is really going to be a culmination of everything you've learned throughout this entire semester. I need to be able to evaluate your progress throughout the semester. Everybody's got to do it. I know it sucks. I'm sorry, but it is what it is. I need it in by midnight. Like I said, it should take, I, I don't even think it'll take you an hour to do. Uh, my goal is if I can do it in less than three minutes, you should be able to do it in less than an hour. Um, so I will let you know when it's been posted. Uh, it will likely be posted around the time that this video is actually finally getting uploaded to YouTube. Um, so with that said, uh, this concludes the course. Thank you for first coming to class, and then thank you for not coming to class once, you know, you weren't supposed to come to class anymore. Uh, thank you for watching my videos. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure, even through the midst of all this COVID-19 crap. Um, so I wish you all the best of luck in your studies. Um, I would say if I was teaching another class next semester, that was a different one to take it, but I won't be here anymore. Um, and uh, so, yeah, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks, guys. It's You really made my last semester here really fun, so I appreciate it. Thank you.